This will be a first for the Meatball Composer Podcast. There will be no sports discussion on this episode. And there will also be no music discussion. No Bears. No Cubs. But hey, no problem. In just a bit, I will be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Keith Lofton, a philosopher, an author, professor, and uh, we're going to talk about that stuff. We're going to talk about more heady intellectual stuff today. I am definitely out of my comfort zone, but it's something I've wanted to do on the show for a while here to branch out just a little bit out of my uh, normal discussion uh, topics. But uh, this is, is an area of interest of mine. I've taken some classes in philosophy and apologetics, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more with, uh, with Dr. Lofton. Uh, but yeah, th- I think this will be a good, uh, good change of pace. So if you're normally tuning into the show and expecting to hear my thoughts on uh, sports-related topics or music-related topics, I hope that uh, this dif- different direction today is of interest to you and appealing. And uh, I'll go get Keith, and let's uh, let's do this. Are you ready for some meatball? I am thrilled to be joined by Professor Dr. Keith Lofton, philosopher extraordinaire. Uh, Keith is a friend and colleague from work. We actually started teaching the same year. That's I true. Believe. That's yeah. true. So uh, I have had Keith as a professor as well as a colleague and a friend, and I wanted to uh, talk to him about part of his research areas and philosophy and upcoming events and books and all those kinds of things. So Keith, <laughs> thanks for being on the show. Yeah, it's or my Dr. pleasure. Lofton, yeah, no, no, Keith is fine. My pleasure. I'm excited about it. Thanks. Those of you who listen to the show and you know Dr. Mark Jensen when I talk bears, uh, Keith is just down the hall. So I'm on the, the smarter end of the hall uh, for this <laughs> interview. So, uh, Keith, you've been a, uh, well, how did you get into philosophy? What's the, why did you? Yeah, that's a great question. When I was an undergraduate, I, well, I grew up on a farm in Louisiana where we didn't really talk much philosophy, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, so when I was an undergrad, I uh, had a required course, uh, intro, Introduction to Philosophy, and I honestly had no earthly idea what to expect uh, in the class. Wound up, uh, d- didn't realize that the professor I had for the class, Dr. Steve Cowan, was an extreme, extremely well-known Christian uh, philosopher. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it just blew me away. Uh, it just opened my mind to a, a perspective on reality that I had never even, uh, never even considered. Yeah. Excellent. So what did you want to do before that, do you know? Like... The reason yeah. I ask is I was going to be a baseball player or a <laughs> private investigator before yeah, I man. was a composer. Uh, I was a little bit athletic in high school, and so I thought I had a chance at maybe sports. But then, you know, when I got to college, I realized that wasn't a reality. <laughs> a little too skinny and slow. Uh, I, I started at, at McNeese State University in uh, Louisiana. I started as an architectural design major. Oh, cool. Uh, loved it, loved architecture, and stank at math. Still do. <laughs> uh, I switched to accounting, which is always kind of weird because if you hate the math, then like, what's with going to accounting? Uh, totally bombed at that, and uh, so went to early childhood education, and uh, just didn't resonate. And looking back now, I can see that I was sort of searching for my vocation. I uh, just just didn't know how to think about uh, vocation correctly. So I transferred to Bible college, long story short, uh, on the assumption that I was going to be a youth pastor. Um, but then when I was in college, my professors, uh, I, I got, grew close to them. Uh, one of them became my father-in-law, in fact. Oh. And uh, just through their sort of mentorship and, and influence, I realized I had a, a some aptitude for philosophy and theology, and so... Here I am, a uh, gazillion and 12 hours of uh, schooling later, a professor of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Now, you brought up the fact that you went to uh, Christian school, Christian background. A lot of people think that faith and reason are two different extremes, not yeah. compatible. Yeah. Like, if you're not a smart person, you have faith. <laughs> yeah, right. So can you address <laughs> that a little bit? 
Yeah, uh, that's a pretty familiar, unfortunately, <laughs> it's a familiar old saw. You hear this a lot, you know, theology or the faith is just a crutch, right. getting along psychologically or... Opiate of the masses. Opiate of the masses mm -hmm. or something something you can believe in when you're young, but then ideally you should grow up and stop believing or having faith. I find those utterly un persuasive, persuasive. Um, what's always absent from those claims is any sort of a robust argument that, that that conclusion is the case. But I think what really lies at the root of those kind of sayings, <laughs> uh, those sort of cultural, you know, assumptions, mm -hmm. is just a total misunderstanding of what what faith is, at least in the Christian tradition. Uh, so you have guys like Richard Dawkins defining faith as believing in the teeth of evidence. But that is, I mean, it's probably the case that there are some religious people out there for whom that is an accurate description mm -hmm. of their faith, and that's, I think, regrettable. But at least for the historic Christian faith, uh, that is not how we mean it. We don't mean faith as some sort of a blind leap into the unknown where you're just sort of guessing and hoping for the best, kind of like the way television and movies frequently talk about uh, yeah. faith. So I think of faith more, I, I use these kind of examples in class a lot. Uh, I'm married to uh, a great gal, Julie, we'll hit 15 years this year. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm as shocked as anyone, <laughs> trust me. Somebody lost some money somewhere. <laughs> Boy, that was, yeah. <laughs> well, I had faith in Julie on the day we got married, otherwise I wouldn't have married her. But I have a whole lot more faith in Julie now, and it's precisely because there is a proportionate uh, or correlative growth between mm -hmm. uh, the, the increase in the amount of evidence or reasons you have to place your trust or confidence in a person and the level of trust or confidence you have. Yep. Uh, same way with my bank. I keep on putting my uh, paychecks in the bank because... I have increasingly over the years more reasons to trust the bank. Mm. And that's the way it is uh, in my Christian faith as well. The more that I study, the more arguments I evaluate for and against theism, uh, the more I consider my own uh, personal experience with uh, the Lord in my life, the more confident I grow. Uh, and so I, I agree with Thomas Aquinas, you know, Medieval, I've heard him. medieval church father, <laughs> that uh, that uh, there's a a, a collaborative, a, um, a together in growth relationship between faith and reason. Yeah. yeah. Now I've heard even from the opposite side, people who are uh, religious, call themselves <laughs> Christians, would say, "Oh, I don't want any of that <laughs> that book study stuff yeah. that just gets in the way of faith." And so, same question, but from the other yeah, side. Yeah, that's a really interesting take, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's like this ironic problem. You think if there's anywhere in society where the, the, the notion of faith has been kept safe, uh, uh, and, you know, the historic understanding has been preserved, you'd think, well, good grief, wouldn't be in the churches. But, yeah, I don't know which is, which is um, more disappointing, the yeah, serious. misattribution by culture to believers of some blind faith or what we find among some believers. Yeah, so what I would and, and, and indeed have said to these people is that um, for a lot of people's personal experience as a, as a confessional individual, a lot more book learning probably <laughs> is going to threaten their mm. uh, their um, experience with faith. Notice I don't say threaten faith itself. I emphasize threaten yes. their personal experience because a lot of people, including Christians, are intellectually lazy. And I think that that's a lamentable thing. And certainly Christians are not the exception here. They're just another element of society that doesn't want to think terribly hard sometimes. But I don't think that, that characterizes most Christians, okay. thankfully. So I tell them um, the Bible commands it. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's adequate 
motivation. <laughs> but we That's just, a good point. <laughs> you know, we just think about cultural engagement. Think about uh, teaching our children not only to believe certain things, but why certain things are believable. You know, why we believe the things that we believe. Right. Um, it's true that my grandma and my mom taught me growing up that there is a God. And mm -hmm. I think sure. they, mom and grandma telling you something, there's all things being equal, a good reason to believe it. But I don't think that it's just enough. Sure. And I think, yes, yeah, as, as culture continues to change, I think believers have to be doing the hard work of, you know, once in a while turning off the TV and, and picking up a demanding book or participating in, you know, a, a demanding Bible study or an apologetics group. Yeah. yeah. We'll get to apologetics uh, yeah, in man. a second. All right, sorry. But no, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. But I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. All right. And this is something that I've heard um, a lot the last few years is basically the idea that, well, back then, you know, you had supernatural stories to explain things yeah. we didn't have scientific understanding oh, for. But yeah. now we have science. <laughs> so that's the ultimate uh, arbiter of what's true and what's factual. And religion, well, it served a purpose at one point, but now... So what do you what do you say to yeah. someone who comes up to you with that? Yeah, is this what you've been thinking lately? Is this a... Oh, yeah. Is this I, a cry for help? <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I plug the fridge in and things get cold. I don't know what to do. You know? <laughs> yeah, this is a really good question. Science is really an interesting thing. Um Science, like science. science is not a new, is not a new thing. Yes. So in the Enlightenment, this is uh, you know 1600s and 1700s, I think starting with a guy named Francis Bacon. Uh, mm, science, science, uh, <laughs> the meaning of that word science shifts. Mm, okay. Now science didn't begin in the modern era. But science in the modern sense began in the modern era. Mm -hmm. So Francis Bacon and then another uh, French philosopher named uh, René Descartes sort of infamously uh, looked to the modern project, and in particular science, as making human beings, and I quote, the masters and possessors of nature. Hmm. And as that sounds like what modern man is all about, right? We're not, yeah. We don't really think in terms of prioritizing uh, the flourishing of others, the shalom of God's creation, we tend to think about, you know, increasingly mastering and just possessing, like being the boss of other right. people and stuff, yeah. technology and so on. Uh, you know, there's some good and some bad there. I don't want to chase a rabbit trail, but I want to establish how very different that is. So um, Aristotle it lived a little bit before the Enlightenment, like over a thousand years before the Enlightenment. <laughs> and Aristotle gave us uh, what are regarded as among the earliest and best works of science. Hmm. Uh, so he's sort of remembered as a philosopher, but he wasn't right. only a philosopher. He was a scientist, a natural philosopher, as they were called then. And he defined science as, so anything is a science, any discipline counts as a science, if it has a couple of things. Uh, firstly, uh, a specifiable, readily identifiable object of study. Okay. It is a source of tr genuine knowledge, not just mere opinion. Okay. And uh, it proceeds along the, uh, uh, it proceeds on the basis of uh, a, a known uh, sort of procedure. It has, a, it has its okay. own procedure. Or method, that mean, method of study. Does that mean music could be a science? Yes, <gasps> do, no doubt. And, and I'm a scientist. I want to say I almost want to say that Aristotle <laughs> calls music a science. Ah, okay. uh, this I is should why, know that. <laughs> all right, the guy we mentioned a minute ago, Aquinas, yeah. talks about sacra doctrina, the science of sacred doctrine, which is theology. It's a science. Mm -hmm. But today, so in the Enlightenment, the meaning of science shifted a lot. It shifted to focus only on those disciplines that we nowadays would think of as the hard sciences. Okay. Uh, chemistry, okay. physics. I see. And those things are empirically testable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so to witness how, how ridiculous this has become, um, think about when, when you watch television. Even like uh, commercials to sell lipstick to uh, our wives or to sell mm -hmm. cars and trucks. 
the people, the actors are dressed up how? In white lab coats. <laughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that seem odd? That's I mean, a good it's, point. <laughs> it's just it's just sort of a silly thing you notice about the way in which culture has absorbed the modern sense of mm. science. Whereas we think of things like literary studies and mm -hmm. these days music. I mean, if you went to a conference and tried to, with a straight face, tell people that music is a science, you'd get laughed out of right. the laughed out of the place. Yep, that's what and I for asked. philosophy and theology, my discipline's the same way, yeah. and that's too bad. So I want to say that science in the modern sense is a source of knowledge. We've learned a lot from modern science. Mm -hmm. Think of think of medicine and so forth. Yeah. But, and this isn't to be blamed on the scientists, but blamed on the philosophers of science, that it's a pity that so many other genuine sources of knowledge, like literature and theology and music, mm. have ceased being uh, regarded as science. Mm. Ah, I see. So, the uh, the disparity of science as being the only place to find truth isn't really true to the historical definition of science. Yeah, that's then? totally true. Absolutely ah, right. Interesting. And okay. so, this phenomena, the looking to science as the only arbiter or source of truth, is sort of the Enlightenment problem on steroids, mm. and it's become known as scientism. Okay, yes. And uh, great, great philosopher J.P. Moreland just came out with a book like last year called Scientism. Highly recommend it. Okay. It just uh, shows how bankrupt that Fascinating. view hmm. of knowledge is. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Because yeah. that, that's, you know, there, there's celebrities out there now that are, you know, <laughs> You know, they call them science guys, let's yeah. say, you know, just for example. <laughs> or TV shows about, you know, the cosmos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. you know, they're almost, you know, patting you on the head saying, oh, you have, you know, this religion. That's nice, but it doesn't give you truth like <laughs> yeah. science does. So I yeah. know that's a hot, a hot uh, topic issue for a lot of yeah. people. And I know people that have stopped pursuing or exploring faith <clears throat> because there's this idea that you have to choose one or the other. Yeah, that's that is. I regret when that sort of thing happens, um, and I think Christians are just as guilty of it. Yeah, in a lot of I think cases. they are. But I think there's sort of a couple of really obvious problems with that scientism. I mean, so the claim that science is the only legitimate source of mm -hmm. knowledge, ironically, is not discoverable scientifically. <laughs> that's a philosophical position about mm. science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of how many things science can't prove, but science depends upon to do its work. Science assumes moral truths, for example, ah, that it's yes. that it's morally wrong, not just inconvenient, but wrong to fabricate the findings of your scientific study, hmm. for example, because the scientific community depends on the truth telling in reporting analysis. Ah, yes. yeah. it, it assumes that the universe didn't just pop into existence five minutes ago with the appearance of age. And I defy you to show me a science experiment that will prove otherwise. Yeah, that's so, a good point. So there's like a bunch of, when you really sort of do some study on <laughs> sure, it, sure. It, sort of, it sort of becomes obvious how absurd the claim that science is the only source of knowledge really is. Yeah. yeah. But well, I love science. I love scientists. I'm really grateful for them. Sure. Well, thanks for addressing that. Yeah. I hope that that's helpful or beneficial to, uh, to listeners. Uh, so now, uh, this is a good point. I think I want to go into apologetics because right. I first really got to know you and the other philosophy professors here through apologetics, the coursework here at our school, and the conference that's uh, an annual event. Yeah. So can you tell just briefly what is apologetics? Because sure. I went to a Christian college, four years at a Christian college, yeah. and I heard the word apologetics. I had no idea what it yeah, was or what it meant. Yeah, you went to a great Christian college. I uh, did. Yeah, but, so the, you know, the, old, the old gag is that apologia or apologetics is, you know, weirdly the, the, the process of learning to apologize for right. being a Christian. But, you know, <laughs> of course, haha, -ha, that's not what it means. Yes. It, it, it's just the Greek, uh, it's just the English rendering of the Greek word apologia. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a word that's found a couple times in the, uh, in the New Testament, apologia or its cognates. But it's not a, a word that originates in the New Testament. It's, you know, it's all, when you, if you read like, Plato's classic work on uh, his teacher Socrates's uh, trial. Uh, you know, Socrates has to go to court and give his defense. It's the same word, apologia. So it just means a defense, not in the, not in the like 
fist fight self defense mm -hmm. connotation, but more like what a what a defense attorney does. Nice. You know, if if we if I go to court and I bring you as my defense attorney, I'm going to expect you to really have thought carefully through all aspects of the case, both for and against, so that we'll be ready for whatever the prosecutor throws at us. It's that kind of that kind of sense. Yeah. Now I and after I started looking into apologetics and reading books on it, taking classes yeah. on it. Um, I was fascinated, and it, it seemed like there, this was a hole in my uh, faith life that uh, yeah. that I didn't even realize was there. Yeah. Uh, but I've also, in talking to other Christians, that they tend to uh, look down on apologetics or disparage apologetics and yeah. say, oh, well, that's just, you know, that gets in the way of... So have you heard that as... Yeah. In your work as a philosopher, apologist, yeah. have you... Yeah, I have. What I, do you say? Let me say yeah. first, I really commend you, though. Um, I think that the, that your experience is a familiar one to a lot of uh, a yeah. lot of believers, not just, you know, Baptists or Catholics or Presbyterians, but just sort of across the board. A lot of believers have made assumptions about what constitutes the Christian life well-lived, and a lot of the things that they're doing and thinking are indeed an important part. But just like, um, just like a, a well-balanced diet physically, you, you know, I may not like vegetables. Who does? And, and in fact, I don't like <laughs> vegetables. Uh, and as a kid, I just you know, did yep. everything I could to avoid them. Kind of see the parallel here. <laughs> uh, yes. But like them or not, enjoy it or not, I had to learn as an adult that I'm not going to enjoy a very lengthy adulthood if I don't find a yeah. way to mm -hmm. incorporate diet into my diet vegetables. Yeah. So I did. And why would I do that? Because I understand that it's a fact with no care whatsoever about my opinion or preferences that vegetables are an integral part of a healthy diet. And it's the same way with apologetics for the Christian life. Mm. I want to portray apologetics as fun and engaging and interesting. You know, I want Christians to do apologetics because they want to do it. Mm -hmm. But whether they want to or not, I think that Scripture is clear. Apologetics is a non-negotiable for a healthy, yep. balanced spiritual life. And so I think you're, you're to be commended for realizing that uh, ignorance is no defense when it comes to mm -hmm. apologetics. You're it's straight there. It's right there in First Peter three fifteen. It's right there right. In, in Acts seventeen. Um, so, but yeah, despite that, I we do hear sometimes that, uh, and I I think a lot of times Christians mean well. You know, I don't think they set out to disparage apologetics. I think most of the times they mean well, but they just have prioritized other commandments, say mm, the command to evangelize, you know, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19. Right. And we're head over heels about the Great Commission. I mean, Absolutely. Scripture is clear. Sharing oh, sure. the gospel is a non-negotiable part of the Christian life. It's, mm -hmm. it's one of those necessary elements of a healthy spiritual diet. Absolutely. But balanced is an important part of balanced diet. So think of this, if God is the ultimate, if he's maximally authoritative, then anything that God commands Christians to do is maxed out authority, like it's a non-negotiable. We don't get to pick and choose, like a buffet of sure. God's commands. Yeah, right. And just because we put on our obedience plate a healthy serving of evangelism, which I think we have to do, yeah. doesn't mean it's okay to just turn around and go back to our table now. Mm. No, there are these other things that God has commanded and so I think that we need to we need to take a little more seriously, uh, you know, this fully orbed view of the Christian life that takes into consideration vocations like the importance of work, yeah. as well as apologetics, as well as the gospel. Excellent. So well, I, so I tend to po point those people to Scripture. Yeah. Oh yeah, that that makes sense. I think that's a good <laughs> idea. Uh, now every year at our school, Southwestern Seminary, there is an apologetics conference. The yeah. Stand Firm apologetics conference and it happens to be this weekend here in fort worth so uh do you want to throw a little commercial out there for it uh, <laughs> yeah absolutely what you're doing or uh speakers or what's going on yeah i uh i was just trying to decide is is this our fourth 
year to do the Stand Firm Conference. Does that sound sound about right? Fourth or fifth, yeah. That's something I should know, but don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, our colleague Travis Dickinson yes. here in the philosophy department, he spearheads uh, this uh, on behalf of the department. Uh, this is the fourth or fifth year we've had such terrific speakers in the past, Jay Warner Wallace, J.P. Moreland, Tim McGrew, and other, uh, John Mark Reynolds. Mm -hmm. um, so Nancy Piercy. Yeah, Nancy Piercy. Yeah. I mean, we've had some phenomenal yes, speakers, really. Absolutely. Uh, and some well-known atheists uh, as well, and that's going to be the case again this year. Mm -hmm. So we take the, the name of the, of the conference is sort of a, 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 a what's the word I'm looking for, a, a, a takeaway from a, a, a verse in Jude, a small book in the New Testament. So if you find Revelation, it's uh, right before that one. Okay. Uh, in Jude chapter 1, verse 3, um, so Jude is talking about, uh, he, he's, he's writing to an audience saying that he feels compelled to write to them and urge them to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. He urges them to stand firm. Uh -huh. So that's where kind of where we take the, the name from. And uh, so this weekend, it's, it's almost always the last weekend or close to the last weekend in March, the March 22nd, yep. 23rd. Uh, we're going to have our, I guess, fifth. Uh, that's Friday a, that's night. That's significant. Yeah. Five year anniversary. I yeah. think so. I think it's. I think it's pretty cool that it's yes. still happening. Uh, Friday night there'll be a debate between uh, yeah. Douglas Guyvet, who is a friend of our department and a uh, well established philosopher at uh, Talbot, uh, a seminary affiliated with Biola University in California, mm -hmm. and Michael Roos, mm -hmm. who is. Uh, professor of the philosophy of science at uh, Florida State University, I oh, believe, okay. where, he, where he heads up a center. Michael Roos and Doug Guybert both have published, I mean, a, a pile of books apiece and a gazillion articles. They're both well-known authorities, and they're both really nice guys, yeah. I will say. Uh, Michael Roos is, of course, not, not a believer. He's an atheist. He published a chapter in my first book, oh, uh, God and Morality, First View, Four Views, years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's really good about def interacting with Christian arguments. And he doesn't agree with them, unfortunately, yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but he takes takes our work seriously. And we take his That's work great. seriously. Yeah. And uh, so that'll be the, uh, the the sort of the headline of Friday evening. But then uh, on Saturday, we're going to move over to the Riley Center. That's our sort of on-campus event center. Yep. And there's going to be a bunch of breakout uh, talks. Uh, the guys in our department, so myself, uh, I'm giving a talk on the the, the question, who made God? Oh. An, our, an objection kind of popularized by Richard Dawkins and others. Yeah. Uh, Ross Inman, uh, Dr. Inman is in, in our department, and he's going to talk on uh, the hiddenness of God. Uh, Travis Dickinson is uh, speaking. I, I don't remember offhand what Travis's topic mm -hmm. is going to be, unfortunately, uh, but we have other uh, speakers that are not members of our department, but are friends of the department. Steve Lee uh, is, is a, is a long-term, highly respected uh, Christian high school teacher of apologetics oh, okay. uh, over in Plano. Great. Uh, Katie Stout mm -hmm. is, uh, is a, 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 one of our students, actually, and a, and a, a well-established writer. I think Excellent. she's going to talk about how to survive being a Christian in the arts. Yes. I'm really excited about that uh, component. As am I, as yeah. being a Christian in the arts. For yes. sure, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, um, uh, we, we have a guest uh, speaker. Uh, sh I believe the way her name is pronounced is Sharice Narte. Okay. She is a scientist. Excellent. Uh, I believe in the Dallas area. She'll talk about the beauty and complexity of biology in the universe. Oh, it's going to be. I'm fantastic. I'm planning to get to that talk. Yeah. Uh, Corey Miller is the president of the the National Apologetics Organization, Ratio Christi, and uh, Corey has come and done uh, talks for us. I think each year as well. So he's a great friend of our department. Excellent. Yeah, so it's it's going to be a nice lineup. It's a substantive conference. It's cheap, um, and it, there's. Sessions designed for people who are brand new to apologetics, but there are also some sessions that are set aside for people who are not brand new. So like yourself, you've got a lot of training under your belt already. Mm -hmm. So there's some talks that are not for beginners, but are for a more advanced audience. We're pumped about it. Excellent. And if people want to learn about that, is it 
uh, swbts.edu slash stand firm. Does that sound? Yeah, I think it's uh, stand hyphen firm okay. hyphen apologetics. Okay. Or if you like just that. go to our school's yeah. website, you yeah, scroll down, a, there's a... Uh, yeah, if you just Google. Yeah, Google. Stand firm 2019 apologetics yeah. or something, you'll find it easy. And yeah. it's this weekend, March 22nd and 23rd in Fort Worth at Southwestern Seminary. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that'd be great if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and a listener of this... Uh, Fine sports meathead ball. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, come and check it out. Well, great. Keith, thank you so much for uh, for jumping on. You are the first non-sports interview I've ever had on well, this. Well, I am a little so disappointed you. that you're not uh, committing episodes to my Saints. <laughs> I think we've got some LSU Tigers stuff we could yeah, talk about. Yeah, I, I am ignorant when it comes to uh, college football, unfortunately. Um, except I know I don't like Alabama, so that's <laughs> you better good. thank them for their last couple of seasons of success. Though. <laughs> I know, I know they've given the Bears some wonderful the Bears players. Have, so. have, uh, reaped a lot of fruit. From I this. know, and a new uh, Ha Ha Clinton Dix, the Bears yeah. just signed in free agency. That's right. So. I mean, how, it's how, it's good for him in his thirty second year in the league <laughs> to find a place. I just think that's nice. That <laughs> he was uh, at Alabama a little longer than yeah. that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, Dr. Keith Lofton, yeah, thank you pleasure. so much. My and, pleasure. And uh, uh, I always buy guests coffee, so I'll take it. I will buy you a coffee take sometime down the road. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, yeah. Bob. Well, I wasn't going to talk any bears today, but some snuck in there at the end. I guess I just couldn't help myself. I really hope you enjoyed today's show, the different direction, the different topics of discussion. Thank you again, Dr. Lofton, for joining the show. Hope to have you again on, uh, on again in the near future. And maybe, uh, maybe sometime I'll do a show with, uh, with Keith and Mark together. We can talk about the philosophy of being a Bears fan. That would be interesting. Maybe to like three people. Appreciate you as always listening. If you want to reach me, you can find me on Twitter at MeatballComp34 or send me an email, the Meatball Composer at mail.com. Feel free to share this episode, especially if you have some uh, friends interested in philosophy and theology. And uh, I was glad we got to talk a little bit about bringing those things together and how they're not, uh, not meant to be separate. Thank you again for tuning in. Talk to you next time. There'll be more Bears next time. Probably a little Cubs. Oh, yeah, I do want to talk about the Cubs next time because the Cubs are opening their season down here in Arlington to uh, play the Rangers. So I will talk about that next time. Until then, stay meatball-y, my friends. You've been meatballed. <laughs> the podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.